and gentlemen, welcome back. As you can see from the uh, agenda, well, okay, it was up, but uh, this is the final of the uh, day, and it is called the role of the Indo-Pacific Command in ROK U.S. Defense and Diplomacy. This group of experts uh, will discuss how Indo-PACOM supports the Korea-U.S. alliance, and their perspectives will be found nowhere else, and so we're extremely proud uh, to have them here. I am honored to introduce our moderator, Dr. Stephen Norper. Steve is a great friend of KDVA and CUSEP, and he's a true supporter of the men and women who built the strong alliance between Korea and the United States. You can see Steve's bio in the program, uh, but let me just highlight that he has more than three decades experience in academic, nonprofit organizations, public service, and the private sector. Dr. Norper most recently uh, led policy programs at the Korea Society for 12 years and taught Korea and Northeast Asia relations at Columbia University for five years. General Brooks selected him to be the first moderator of KDVA and KUSEF's webinar about the ROK U.S. Combined Forces Command in 2020. Highly successful and well received. So ladies and gentlemen, let's please welcome Dr. Stephen Norper, our moderator for panel two. Sure. Thank you, Steve. And, and really, I, I wanted to begin with two acknowledgments, uh, one, one clearly here uh, to uh, General Brooks and, and Steve Lee for, for getting us here today and making this happen at a time when we're challenged by the pandemic and, and lots of other things. And this has really been a remarkable uh, event uh, all the way through. Uh, one of the things my children enjoy doing at this time of year is watch White Christmas about 27 times in 10 days. And uh, anyone who has seen that classic 1945 film with Bing Crosby and Danny Kaye, I know that, that one of the key uh, numbers in that is, is uh, in a salute to the general retired is, is what to do with the general when he stops being a general. And I have to say that uh, we are graced because uh, our, our generals here uh, do not stop being uh, generals, and so they have inspired many of us, uh, not only in the military, but in the civilian communities with their thoughtfulness and strategic insights and, and events like that. So thank you, uh, General Brooks, for all that you have done, the example you've done, and for really trailblazing and making great decisions at a, a very critical time when you were there in command and for what uh, you uh, have done since. And uh, Steve Lee, thank you. I know this was uh, extremely complex to put together, but it's been a wonderful, wonderful time, and I know we're all grateful. Uh, my second acknowledgement, uh, since I see Pak Shun in the back of the room, is really to the uh, uh, Korean consulate here. They were cited a bit earlier in the program, uh, but what they did in terms of uh, having uh, President Moon Jae-in here in September was incredibly important. Uh, what they did in terms of the handover of remains, and then, of course, uh, up at uh, University of Hawaii in terms of the awarding of medals uh, posthumously, uh, posthumously, which reminds us uh, of the contributions of the, the Korean-American community here and what that has meant to connect Hawaii. Uh, and so your efforts uh, were tremendous, and uh, this is something that I wish some of uh, our more senior colleagues in Washington uh, would, would pay attention to. And so hopefully as these processes continue, uh, because what President Moon did here and what your representation uh, did here in September was give us really a highlight story of the year uh, for all the reasons we heard in the last panel. Uh, to transition to this panel, to the role of Indo-Pacific Command in ROK U.S. Defense and Diplomacy, uh, we are really graced with uh, some brilliant minds, and, and so thank you all for coming. And uh, we will begin, and I'll go through in the order of this excellent program, uh, each uh, one by one. I will begin with uh, uh, Daniel Rockman, the Foreign Policy uh, Advisor uh, to the Commander at, at U.S. Army uh, Pacific. And uh, we're graced to have him. He has been here uh, since September uh, and is a career member uh, of the Senior Foreign Service. And you will see in his distinguished bio uh, really a rich exposure uh, in particular on East Asia and Pacific affairs. And uh, let me turn first to him uh, for his insights and then we'll move on further down the line. So good afternoon and, and thanks to everyone uh, for giving me this opportunity to speak to you. Also a great opportunity uh, for me to be here with you. I really appreciate it and uh, all the important work that you do. So I guess the place to start is talk about uh, what a foreign policy advisor is because it's something that's not uh, really well known, I think, uh, to large 
groups of people. And to a certain extent, the, the name Foreign Policy Advisor describes what we do. We provide foreign policy advice to, to the commander that we work for, in my case, General Flynn. But that's really only a portion of uh, what we do. And I think the bigger role that we play is to be a hub or a conduit for the commands that we work for. Uh, and the State Department back in Washington, the interagency, the NSC, and then to all the embassies in the, in the AOR. So we cover 36 countries. And me being here allows our command to have reach and connections with the country team, the ambassador, the DCM, the political sections, and, and everyone else on the civilian side of the embassies. And we'll talk a little bit more about how that works later on. But so while I do work for for the commanding general, I always say that there are 106,000 personnel in USERPAC, and there's one State Department person, and and that's me. So I can only do so much. But by being here, and frankly having access to the State Department global address list and, and, and being on State Department systems, I can reach back to Washington and all the embassies. And I'll talk a little bit about how we make use of that and how that benefits uh, both our countries and all our friends and allies in, in the region. Um, the theme of this conference, I understand, is the role of Hawaii. And Hawaii is really unique in terms of uh, foreign policy advisors, because while we have um, foreign policy advisors at, at the, at the the COCOMs around the world and at the various components and in places like uh, Omaha, Nebraska, where I'm from, at Offutt uh, Air Base, at STRATCOM, the largest concentration of foreign policy advisors anywhere in the world is here in Hawaii because we have, we have not just uh, Indo-PACOM, but we have all five components in one place and we also have uh, APCSS and, and some other things going on as well. So this is really a place, and, and people maybe don't think about this, where the State Department and the U.S. military are more closely connected probably than just about anywhere other than, than, uh, than in Washington. So the role, as I said, is to do these connectivities between the two different parts of government or multiple parts of government. So from my perspective, what we do at USERPAC, at our command, is sort of nested within what Indo-PACOM as a whole does. But that's nested in what the U.S. government as a whole does in the region to advance our interests and interests of our allies, whether it's militarily, diplomatically, or through trade, investment, exchanges, and things like that. Uh, so my being here allows me to provide insights into the command about how what the the initiatives or actions that the command is pursuing fit into the larger uh, perspectives of what the U.S. government's doing, and in turn, to take that back to Washington so people in the State Department who might not be aware of what uh, USERPAC is doing on joint training with Korea or, you know, maybe what the future of posture looks like from our perspective here in Hawaii so they can have those insights and also back to our embassy in Seoul. Um, so to talk just a little bit about, to take that to the bilateral level, where we meet uh, at the highest level in terms of interagency is, is, of course, the two plus two. So we have our Secretary of Defense, Secretary of State, Defense Minister, uh, Foreign Minister, met most recently in, in March. And that's really where a lot of this comes to a head, not just with, with Korea, but with all our uh, partners that we hold similar exchanges with. So in the lead up to those two plus two meetings, we have a lot of work interagency and with counterparts to nail down uh, what, we're, what we're going to do, what we're going to say. And a lot of these things is just like, you know, reaffirming that, you know, the alliance is a linchpin of, of security in, in the peninsula and in the region, all those good things that you know. But it's also an opportunity for us to look forward about how we're going to move the alliance ahead. And so a lot of that work takes place among the four, four ministries, two in Korea and, and two in the United States. So it's really a joint diplomatic, military, or security enterprise. Um, and among the things that we're most focused on, of course, is a threat posed by North Korea's uh, weapons of mass destruction programs and the, the means of delivering them. So it's the State Department who, ha of course, has the lead when we're negotiating with North Korea or formulating policy on that. 
but we want to make sure that the entire interagency is plugged into that. So we're doing a lot of work in in Washington and places like uh, in places like Hawaii to make sure that the policies align and that we're we're you know calibrating how we use all the tools at our disposal. But equally important, if not more important, is the fact that with particularly with two main allies, uh, Japan and, and Korea, anytime we talk with North Korea, which we haven't lately, but we're open to doing that again, before, during, and after those discussions, we will engage with our ROK counterparts to make sure that they're fully aware of what we're doing and that we're, we're integrating uh, Korean perspectives into how we proceed. But, e but in the time before that, for the months or years leading up to that, we're, we're very much engaged. And, and when the new, this administration came into office, one of the very first things they did was to do a North Korean policy review. And that was done in very close coordination. I was in some of the meetings I was serving in Japan at the time, but we did the same thing with Korea, was to have some deep discussions, interagency discussions, with our, with our counterparts on their perspectives and how we should proceed because we, ultimately we won't be successful unless we do this with, with Korea and with Japan and make sure that their perspectives are taken into account and, and the value that they bring to how we proceed on this. And then finally, since we have limited time, I just wanted to talk about how, the, how what I do reflect, reflects sort of uh, interagency integration, but it's just really a small portion of the whole of government connection that we have between the two countries. So we have the alliance and we have our common diplomacy, our common foreign policy. Uh, but also, probably, you know, one of the most tight bonds we have is with, is with Korea. And it's because of economic and people to people and cultural exchanges. So Korea is, our, I think, our sixth largest uh, trading partner for the United States. And even during the pandemic, we had $156 billion <laughs> of uh, trade last year. Probably even more important than that economic connection is people people connection. Today is a prime example of that. But uh, since 1955, I think there's been uh, 1.7 million uh, Korean nationals have studied in the United States, and uh, they contribute. They continue to have a very high number of students in the United States. And in the last year before the pandemic, in 19 er, in 2019, 2020, academic year, there were nearly 50,000 Korean students in the United States. So this is, allows people to, at an early age, to build understanding and connections. At the next level up, we do a lot of exchanges. There's been over 10,000 people who've participated in U.S. government-sponsored uh, exchanges like the Fulbright program. Uh, there's been 3,600 Fulbrighters going back and forth, so that's a year in each other's country. We do other programs for for uh, politicians, legislators, uh, mid-career professionals on international visitor programs. We've had over 2,000 of those as well. So again, that just scratches the surface, but I do want to stress that the reason I'm here in Hawaii and the reason we have more uh, foreign policy advisors in Hawaii than anywhere else is because of the importance that the State Department places on the work that's being done here by our, by our Indo-PACOM and, and and uh, component colleagues, and, and I think there is obviously a recognition that this uh, AOR is, is the most important for us in, in the present and, and into the future. So again, thank you very much for allowing me the chance to meet with you all. Thank you, Mr. Rooker. Uh, let us turn now uh, to Professor uh, Hong Kyu Dok, uh, who is a former Deputy Minister uh, for Defense Reforms at MND and a professor at uh, Sukmyung Women's University. Uh, he has uh, taught there uh, since uh, 1993 and is a professor in the Department of Political Science uh, and International Affairs. Uh, he is also the co-chair of uh, CSCAP uh, Korea, the Council of Security Cooperation in the Asia Pacific. Uh, please, uh, Professor Hong. Thank you, Mr. Chair. General Brooks, General Chong, General Lee, General Shin, and my, you know, the mentor as well as my good friend, Ralph Kosa. I'm very honored to be here to share my views with you. And the, I was asked to the, discuss about the, the nexus between South Korea's 
new southern policy and the, the United States, you know, into China, the policy strategy. And then the, the meaning of the Security Council meeting that just happened in the, the December 2nd the in Seoul. So, you know, the, before starting my point, uh, I would like to, you know, the remind that remind you that the I'm very delighted to have you know the Stephen Norper as a moderator because you know the he's one of the best you know the the South Korean foreign policy expert because you know the I used his dissertation as a textbook for my graduate students as well as my undergraduate student. He wrote you know how Korea succeed you know as a small country to get recognized from the world. So the I think if you have not had a chance to read him, so you know the dissertation, you probably want to do that because you know that that's one of the best ones we have in you know in in the, this field of you know foreign policy as well as international relations. So having said that, the back to my original topic, the Republic of Korea's you know new southern policy, we call the Shin Nambang Jongchek. It's a foreign policy aimed at ASEAN countries, which was decided during the President Moon Jae-in's visit to Southeast Asia in 2017. In fact, the idea that South Korea's new southern policy and the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy should find a common denominator was first mentioned in a joint statement by President Moon after a summit meeting with the former President Donald Trump before the Panmunjom meeting in 2018. But the question arises as to how much progress has been made since then. So let me introduce you know, the one recent article written by Adam Gad uh, in The Diplomat. The you know, title of the, the article is that Why South Korea Fell Behind Japan in Southeast Asia. It sounds very interesting, right? So the, you know, the, according to Adam Gad, you know, the, the ambiguous and ambivalent attitude of the Korean government, uh, which is sending a mixed signal that on the one hand, it will link with the U.S. in the Pacific strategy, but to some extent, it will also consider China's Belt and Road Initiative on the other. The, according to him, that nearly hurts South Korea's re- reputation as a reliable security partner. So this contrasts with the Japanese government, which has gained the trust of Southeast Asian countries by showing a clear head-to-head attitude toward China. I think his assessment is not without exaggeration, but I think the Korean government is painfully considering this point and needs to take more practical participation in the region to provide specific defense cooperation and security support with Cambodia, Philippines, Indonesia, Vietnam, Laos, Thailand, and Malaysia. And above all else, the Korean government needs to establish an active stance toward China. In this respect, I would say that the outcome of the 53rd Security Consultative Meeting, which was held at the Ministry of National Defense of the Republic of Korea on December 2nd in Seoul, can have significant implications. What stands out in the SCM joint communique is that it mentioned the importance of the link between the rock us alliance and the Indo-Pacific strategy. If you look at the, carefully the article, the article says that the, both sides pledge to continue to develop the alliance, the linchpin of peace and stability on the Korean Peninsula and in the Indo-Pacific region in a mutually reinforcing and future, I mean, future-oriented manner. You know, the, we have the, the done hard this one many times, right? So nothing wrong with that. But the, my point is that the, this should definitely serve as an opportunity for the two great you know, partners to find a more concrete and practical directions for various links. So we need more action rather than words. So for instance, the ROC and US forces will be able to jointly participate in the protection of sea line of communication in the Indo-Pacific region and joining in HADR operations and develop and protect the Arctic Sea route. And above all, what is eye-catching in this joint communique is that the lessons of Taiwan's trade is specified for the first time in SCM. 
So as always, this heralds a strong backlash from the Chinese government, which has been particularly sensitive to the Taiwan issue in the future. In this regard, I believe that two countries could expand the will of this communique to a more practical level rather than a fig figurative level by preemptively presenting specific issues such as monitoring Chinese maritime militia activities, blocking their access to the East Sea, sort of up to Aleutian and Alaska, and the threat of drones to South Korean naval base. Now, China's threats to South Korea forces has already been revealed in China's drone projection on Korean destroyers returning from participating in RIMPAC training last year. And China's Coast Guard Act the, the, and, you know, the, and the Maritime Safety Act and the crossing the 124 degree border in West, West Sea will be a thorny issue and will increase the tension in the region. So, it is necessary to conduct joint training and joint action against the expanding gray zone activities, such as China's and Russia's invasion of the, the Korean air defense identification zone, which have been carried out twice on July 23rd, 2019, and November 19, 2021. So this joint communique also resulted in the approval of the strategic planning guidance for the modification of our plans. These changes are a result of reflecting the change security environment in this region over the years. As reported, North Korea is already trying to develop the Hwasong-8 hypersonic missile that can neutralize the South Korea and U.S. missile defense system. As you know, that the Chinese government already deployed and planned to mass produce the Chinese Dongpong 17s. The existing opulence that focused only on conventional warfare cannot cope with these challenges from North Korea as well as China. Thus, the establishment of a new offsetting strategy and reinforcement of the missile defense system between the Republic of Korea and the U.S. is very much required. Therefore, Korea must actively work with the United States to refine its new offsetting strategy. In this regard, the ROC Navy is currently considering expanding its light Korea fleet and submarine forces. In addition, I think more efforts should be made to expand South Korea's rocket capabilities, such as expanding production of tactical surface-to-surface -surface guide missiles and to secure tactical ammunition capable of striking underground facilities. Korea's participation in the Quad should also be considered in terms of strengthening Korea's role in the Indo-Pacific region. The Korean government would better first actively engage in the Quad starting with disaster prevention and global health cooperation. In addition, based on this, under the grand principle of gradually joining the Quad, the ROC needs to consider not only participation in the freedom of navigation, operation desired by the United States, but also active participation in joining training and dispatching you know, the more higher officers to the Indo-Pacific Command Overall, the Korean government should seek to play a more active role in the Pacific Defense Initiate promoted by the U.S. government. As you know, joint exercises are already actively underway between the United States and Japan. More attention should be paid to the restoration of the trilateral joint exercise through the normalization of security cooperation between the ROC, the United States, and Japan. As I pointed out above, you know, Korea is dangerously vulnerable to gray zone activities, nuclear shadow, conventional to nuclear escalation, TPI, and regional horizontal escalation. Therefore, the ROG US alliance needs to expand its capabilities to cope with new challenges and threats. The South Korean government is also considering various options, such as reforming the military structure in 2040 to strengthen the capabilities of the South Korean military. Through this reform of the military structure, we hope that more balanced attention should be given to, first, defense readiness and active deterrence across multiple domains. Secondly, more integrated involvement with other government agencies, private sectors, and other NGOs. Thirdly, preparation for command and control over multinational operations against the nuclear threat and operation in a post-nuclear use environment. And finally, 
the better preparation for non-traditional threat, including cyber threat, information operation, and the biological threat. So the upcoming 2022 will be a pivotal moment that will cope with great political and economic upheaval and transition, not only in the Korean Peninsula, but also on the entire Indo-Pacific area. So Korea and the United States should gather wisdom to deal with wisely with the current challenges and uncertainties in the future. I'm very much convinced that the strengthening of the ROC-US alliance and the normalization of military cooperation between the ROC, the United States, and Japan will be the important first step for such efforts. So if I conclude my presentation, this is why the KDVNB and KUSAP hold the conference today. So thank you for listening. I must stop here. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Professor Hong. And uh, we will move directly uh, to uh, Commodore uh, Luke Charles Jones, uh, the Deputy J5 uh, Regional and Multinational Assistant at Indo-PACOM. Uh, he joined the Royal Australian Navy uh, from Victoria in January of 1986 and has a distinguished career. At flag rank, he has served as the Director General Operations uh, at Headquarters Joint uh, Operations Command as Chief of Staff and Deputy Fleet Commander at Fleet Headquarters Sydney, and he is, is now serving as the Deputy J-5 uh, here at U.S. Indo-Pacific Command. Uh, please, Commodore. Thank you. Uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's, my name is uh, Luke Charles Jones and it's my very great pleasure to join you here and the panellists um, this afternoon uh, to discuss US Indo-PACOM's role in the US uh, Republic of Korea Alliance. Now I'm sure you're all sitting there going, why is an Australian uh, come here this afternoon to talk about this? And so it's important to lay the cards on the table. Um, for those of you who've... Um, who know how, how tight the uh, US-Australian alliance is, it should come as no surprise that we have embedded officers throughout numerous uh, US commands uh, throughout the world. Um, my position has been embedded in US Indo-PACOM uh, for at, since at least 2013. And my role isn't to, to be here as an Australian pursuing Australian uh, ac objectives. My here is to be here supporting US and OPACOM in its objectives. And one of those things is my role as uh, the Deputy J5, so plans, policy and strategy. Uh, I've been here since January 2019. Very sadly and unfortunately, I'm, I'm due to finish in January and this is almost my very last engagement. So it's absolute pleasure to be here uh, this afternoon to talk about this. But just, just on that note, you know, uh, working in, in the Deputy J5 and my role is uh, regional and multinational assistance um, supporting the J5. I have had quite a role in supporting uh, the US Korean Alliance, um, visiting Korea on, on multiple occasions. But for those of you um, familiar with uh, Australians in USFK, and also my very great friend and former boss, uh, Vice Admiral Stu Mayer, who is currently the Deputy UN uh, Commander in on the peninsula. Um, you know, we're, unfortunately, we're everywhere, so, um, um, so I'm here today to speak to you. Um, I'm not the only person uh, or the only foreigner in the, in the headquarters. I work alongside a British Royal, Royal Marine, uh, Brigadier Al Lidster. He heads uh, into PACOM security cooperation programs, um, uh, but also there's a number of other Australians and Canadian uh, one SARS and New Zealanders serving in the headquarters. Um, the first time I visited uh, the peninsula was in 1993 as a, a navigating officer on a warship. Uh, I subsequently went back there in 1998 to a beautiful port called Chin Hai uh, and conducted a number of tactical exercises. Uh, then I also visited during my 06 staff course in 2010 where we toured through different universities and, and colleges. Um, and then most recently, uh, twice during 2019, uh, participating in senior leadership dialogues and, and seminars. Uh, unfortunately, then COVID came along and really impacted uh, my ability to, to visit the pen. But, uh, you know, it's true to say that that didn't, that didn't stop our interactions, uh, in fact, accelerated our, our interactions through online uh, discussions and forums. 
and now we're just on the cusp, of course, of, of returning to, um, to visiting one another. So what I'm here to talk about today is U.S. Indipacom's role um, in, in the Alliance uh, and in questions a little bit later on I'll expand on uh, and really to touch on some of the points by my predecessor, um, other things we're doing in the Indo-Pacific to get after you know, the challenges and threats that, that we face and where we might grow the Alliance. Um, I'll read from my notes for a moment because I want to capture the five key things that we at U.S. Indo-PACOM um, focus. Um, so U.S. Indo-PACOM supports the Combined Forces Command uh, through the U.S. Forces Korea by providing forces should hostilities resume on the peninsula. Uh, we advocate for multinational support for the Republic of Korea through the United Nations Command and its relationships throughout the region. Thirdly, we facilitate the trilateral cooperation between the United States, Japan and the Republic of Korea to prepare and respond to DPRK actions. We advance multilateral cooperation throughout the region to advance common security interests. And that, that, for me, is a particular area of focus over the coming years. We also enable diplomacy by leveraging the military instrument of power to provide space or provide room for diplomatic efforts um, from a position of strength. So in the alliance, we've already talked about the, the, the key um, consultative groups, so the military, um, sorry, the security consultative group between uh, the Secretary of Defence for the US and the Minister of Defence for the Republic of Korea, and also the military committee meeting headed by our defence chiefs. So to quote from the most uh, recent meeting on the 2nd of December, um, the US Republic of Korea reliance is stronger than ever based on shared interests and values of mutual trust, freedom, democracy, human rights and the rule of law. So this alliance is in a very strong place. Uh, many of you may have already seen the communique that came out of the 2nd of December um, Security Consultative Group um, meeting. So in that latest Joint Force communique from that activity, it reaffirmed our commitment uh, to combine defence through the Mutual Defence Treaty to defend the peninsula. Our shared commitment to the denuclearisation or the complete denuclearisation on the peninsula and to end um, the ballistic missile threats. Thirdly, the MCM pledged to maintain our fight tonight readiness and preparedness and enhance defence capabilities on, on the pen and update our operational plans that we have ready at any point. At a more tactical level, we're developing the combined joint multi-purpose live fire training complex to make sure we can be as ready and prepared as absolutely possible uh, on the peninsula. And through our uh, tactical type exercises, we continue to assess uh, towards the full operating capability of the condition-based op control transition to what we hope is the future uh, Combined Forces Command model. So, ladies and gentlemen, just in a, uh, the brief minutes I've been allowed, um, I've really introduced to there uh, what US and uh, PACOM's role is in this alliance. There's so much more, of course, that, that I could cover. Um, and one of the things I particularly want to look forward to doing is answering questions on... on broader topics, but also uh, in the later um, discussion, focusing on how we might be able to um, cooperate and reinforce the Alliance uh, through broader approaches across, across the theatre. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Commodore. And uh, let me turn now to uh, Colonel Steve Marshall, uh, Chief of International Affairs Division at Pacific Air Force. Uh, prior to this current assignment, uh, Colonel Marshall was stationed at the United States Air Force Academy where he taught military history before serving as the director of the uh, U.S. Air Force uh, Commander's Action Group and finally as the director of innovation. Uh, and he is a graduate of the Air Force Academy. Uh, Colonel? Thank you, sir. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with these uh, distinguished gentlemen. I am certainly uh, in awe of of everything they've done and appreciate being invited to sit with them, so thank you. On behalf of General Wilsbach, uh, who has a deep relationship with Korea, uh, it's a pleasure to be representing PACAF here uh, in, his, in his stead. He's currently traveling in the, uh, in the United States at the time. Um, I do not have the level of expertise as my, as my colleagues up here, uh, academically speaking. I have regional experience, and that is why I'm in the role currently 
uh, as the Director of International Affairs for PACAF. I was formerly an attache to Thailand, and I bring that up because General Brooks may not remember this, but he probably remembers the incident. I was a C-12 pilot in Nepal, and we were attempting to go to Western Nepal, and uh, we had to turn back around at one point. It was uh, quite an eventful flight, so I bring that <laughs> up to make the connection. Uh, in, I'll briefly just talk about PACAF and our role in this relationship, which is what I've been asked to do, and specifically my uh, office's role. Uh, PACAF, as you know, formerly the Far East Air Force, um, may not have been born in Korea, but we certainly came of age there. Right? This is a deep relationship that goes back uh, for a long time. And so it's an honor for me to represent PACAF in our International Affairs Division, where we have desk officers uh, that support both our Indo-PACOM efforts and our Air Force to Air Force efforts. We currently have desk officers assigned to about 42 different countries. It's a list that seems to grow every day as our European friends uh, want to do more and more in the Indo-Pacific. It's turning into a United Nations of desk officers versus just an Indo-Pacific command. But theoretically, we cover India to some of our South America uh, friends that have Pacific interests. Um, and so in that role, we are specifically aligned to the Air Force to Air Force relationship. That's our goal is to enable that relationship. Whereas our Indo-Pacific takes on the multilateral relationship, we focus on the Air Force to Air Force relationship. We do that through exercises, uh, engagements, subject matter expert, all the way up to key leader engagements. If General Wilsbach travels to Korea, we're responsible for making sure that he meets the right people and, and has productive discussions with his equivalents uh, in Korea while he's there. Um, we're also there to enable the cooperation on an individual level, uh, whether that's exchanges on individual exchanges or any issues that come between our Air Forces. If it turns into a multilateral issue, we'll work with Indo-PACOM to make sure that, that, that we're in alignment with, uh, with their efforts. Um, and it's a little bit different in Korea. Uh, I point that out because we have an established command in Korea, and so our work with Korea while it is continual and demands a lot of our attention, we have a lot of people on the ground in Korea that enable that relationship, similar to what we have in Japan. And so the activities that I have in countries that do not have that, for example, our Southeast Asian friends, uh, compared to what we do in Korea, looks very different. Uh, and it is enabled by the forces we have on the ground and the established command structure that we have. Um, some of the littler things that we do specific to Hawaii, because I know that's the focus of what we do here. We, we work with our consulate here. We have a liaison officer who happens to be in the back looking down. Uh, Colonel Sam, if you want to wave. He's, uh, he sits right down the hall from me. And so we have that direct connection as well um, to enable these, uh, these engagements. Um, a key event that we have, hearkening back to my, uh, he pointed out I worked at the Air Force Academy. Uh, we host the Korean uh, cadets the Republic of Korea cadets, every year they come through, and we get to build a relationship at the lowest level and at the highest level, and so I always have fun um, seeing that relationship built there and then following it up with the General Wilsbach Air Chief to Air Chief relationship. Uh, and so that's a really cool dichotomy that we do, uh, working at the lowest and the highest levels. Um, really our focus is, uh, across Asia, is access basing and overflight. We have no question about that in Korea. We know that we are partners and that the, re the relationship is solid. We want to grow that and increase our capability when it comes to Korea. And eventually, um, in the next round of questions, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the transfer of operational control that's been brought up a couple times here and how we're working towards that. Um, but I will cut this a little bit. I know we're, we're, we're coming up on the end of time, so I will cut this and let it move on to questions because I think that's, everybody probably has questions to ask. So again, thank you for, uh, thank you for having me as a representative of PACAF. It means a lot to us. Thank you, Colonel. Uh, we'll begin uh, with an initial round of your questions, and then we'll move to some moderated discussion. Uh, but if we have any questions from the floor or online to begin. Please. I'm Major General Retired Lee, Korea Chapter President of the KDVA. Thank you for your excellent presentation from Korea and uh, USAPEC, Indo-PACOM, as well as uh, 
back up. It was very uh, useful and uh, very effective presentation, I think. Uh, nowadays, China seeks regional hegemony, also deny the rules-based international order. Even China uh, constructed artificial islands, many artificial islands in South China Sea. Professor Hong suggested Korea need more active participation for Indo-Pacific strategy, as well as Quad also. Uh, Mr. Rockman, you serve the State Department, and uh, you serve Peng now. I think you have the good viewpoint. What do you think Korea need more role, active role, for the Indo-Pacific strategy, including Quad? Please say about that. Thank you very much. That's a great question. Well, well, we certainly encourage Korea to play a more active role in the region. I think Korea is obviously, with the new Southern policy, looking to play a more active role as well. Professor Hong's given a great uh, prescription. I don't. I don't think I can beat his uh, advice. And uh, again, the, the opinions I express here are my own, not the U.S. government. So I need to be careful about that. I'm speaking in my private capacity, although from the perspective of where I work and where I have worked. But I think he's given a, a wonderful set of uh, advice for for Korea, and I can't top that. Um, the the joke about Korea joining the Quad is Korea can't join the Quad because then it's not the Quad, right? So it means four. Uh, so that's that's the joke. But the reality is we want to explore all the ways that are possible for Korea to play an expanded uh, role in the region. And I think, you, you know, frankly, the first the first place and where I think the, all the panelists have have touched on a little bit an area that I've spent a lot of time in my, my career working on is for the United States and its two closest allies in the region to uh, work more closely together. That is, has been, and, and will continue to be a top priority because among the three of us, we not only share uh, values and objectives and interests in the region, but we also have a complementarity of capabilities. So as we work together, we can be greater than the, than the sum of our parts. We can take different and complementary roles in the region. So we understand that, of course, that uh, Japan and Korea have difficult, uh, important, thorny historical issues to deal with, and they get sort of to the heart of the relationship and to the heart of people's feelings, and we understand that. But what we, as the United States government, want to do is facilitate the um, Japan and Korea to, to resolve those issues and help them do that, but at the same time not stop the important work that we have to do together. And, and again, I was at, at something when uh, Ambassador Harris, when he was our ambassador in Korea, said, you know, the United States can't want Japan and Korea to solve their issues more than Japan and Korea do. It, it won't work. So we respect that the parties in these issues have to resolve them. But at the same time, we want to work together. We're increasingly working together. Uh, again, I was at, just before I left uh, Tokyo, I was at the uh, meeting between uh, our Deputy Secretary, Deputy Secretary Sherman, and our Japanese and Korean counterparts. And it was a great meeting. And it was very substantive. And, and uh, the things we can and are increasingly doing together are uh, really important. So, so the first answer to your question is, I think, we need to get that right. We need to get to a place where, where the three of us, our are, are most important allies, are really working closely together. But that's not to say that we don't want Korea to be uh, involved in all these, uh, all these multilateral activities, and particularly the current administration has made it a point to be physically in the region, uh, whether it's US ASEAN, uh, uh, summit meetings or, or ministerials, I should say, both summits and ministerials, or anything else in the region. 
So the U.S. and Korea share this, this regional perspective, you know, what we call ASEAN centrality and respect for those 10 countries and their role in the region, which is, you know, not coincidentally includes some very contested maritime space. Uh, that's not what drives it. I mean, we have shared interests, but that is among the interests that we share. So as, as you've heard, talking about maritime security, freedom of navigation, things like that, I think Korea can play an, an increasing multilateral role. And none of this really has to take away from our commitment to maintaining uh, peace and security on the region. I think both of our governments, both of our militaries are capable of, of multitasking. While we focus on our primary mission on the peninsula, I think we can increase our engagement bilaterally in the region and beyond and multilaterally. So, you know, you've seen this proliferation of different groupings, whether it be the Quad or AUKUS or other things that are coming along. And I expect that as we go forward, we're going to continue to see more of these things. It's just my personal opinion. But we need to expand our toolkit. As we look at dealing with different sets of issues, there will be different configurations that are appropriate for each of the challenges or opportunities that we face. And I am confident, very confident, that moving forward, the Korea-U.S. alliance, the Korea-U.S. bilateral relationship will increasingly play into those efforts, both between ourselves and as new groups with others. So thanks. Thank you. Professor Holm. I, I can echo him, you know, the, what, when Mr. Rochman said, you know, we need to put things right, right? So the, as I just, you know, the present, when I make a presentation, the, I just gave an example of the China and, you know, the, the Russia. Okay, they are, you know, steadily, I mean, steadily moving to deepen their military ties as a part of efforts to counter pressure from the United States, right? And then they just, you know, you know, without notice to enter into the Korean cadiz, right? So I think that reflects the, the weakness of, you know, the cooperation among Korea, Japan, and then the United States. So if we had not done anything, you know, they, they will do it again and again and again. So I think, you know, the, I, I personally think that we can solve the, the historical and political issue overnight. As we have, you know, experienced some common threat, I think we can practically get together to act right, as you just mentioned, right? So that's why I think, you know, that we can move closer to discuss the, the manners, of how we can respond together more effectively. So I think in that case, I think, you know, that this is far away from the Korea. So probably we can share the role between, you know, Japan and Korea, and then probably U.S. will give some, you know, the intelligence, right? So I think in that case, I think the, the, the trilateral cooperation will take place. So we, whenever we meet with, you know, American counterpart, we ask, you know, the, the considering the, the sensitivity between the Japan and Korea, we ask American counterpart, you can probably lead us the, to put the three together, right? So we, we discussed this issue in the morning when we, you know, paid the tribute to, I mean, the Admiral Aquilano in the morning. But I think, you know, the, he made sure that he will lead the kind of initiative. So hopefully we can do practical steps the, for the responding those kind of the threats the, in the future. Thank you. Um, I think I'd be remiss if I didn't invite uh, Commodore uh, Charles Jones or Colonel Marshall yeah, if they had any comments, uh, in particular on expanding roles. Uh, thank you. Some of these uh, remarks get up to something I was going to talk a bit later about, but it, for us, the end state we seek is free and open Indo-Pacific, um, where we maintain the rules-based global order. And so that's what we seek. Um, when Secretary of Defence Austin visited uh, Hawaii in April to oversee the handover from uh, Admiral Davidson to... Uh, Admiral Aquilino, one of the terms he used, which is now resonating throughout the Department of the Defence, is the term integrated deterrence. And so what does that mean? You know, at its most fundamental level, it, I think it's fairly self-evident, but integrated 
of course, means um, linked, cooperating, coordinated, synchronised. Um, deterrence, of course, means, um, you know, persuading um, your adversaries not to pursue the objectives they're going to pursue. And, and so when we put this together, integrated deterrence, what we're seeking to do, is not just within Indo-PACOM, but across uh, the Department of Defence, is to leverage all instruments of national power uh, combined with allies and partners uh, to deter adversaries from their malign objectives. And we, we've already talked about the minor objectives, you know, the territorial claims, particularly the PRC, the ADIS incursions, the human rights abuses, um, the attacks on resources of Vietnam, Malaysia, um, Indonesian fishing in the Antarctica Islands, um, most recently the Philippines, first Thomas Shoals. They're their malign objectives. And unless we work together through a concept such as integrated deterrence, where we we leverage all instruments of national power, so not just the military, but all instruments across all departments in, in a interdepartmental and interagency way, working together with allies and partners in those shared interests, then that makes a difference, and that's essentially what, we'll, what we seek to do. Um, and not, you know, as an Australian, and I'm always in trouble if I talk as an Australian, particularly when I've been away there for three years, but, you know, right now, this very minute, um, President Moon's just been down in uh, Australia and we've signed this new con comprehensive strategic relationship very much coupled with um, the Look South policy and I, I think that is, you know, already um, evidence of, of what we're talking about here this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just briefly add that, uh, you know, along with Indopecom, we are espousing that that in the Indo-Pacific region, we can enable individuals to pursue uh, they, what they want uh, in accordance with rules and norms. We also would like nations to be able to do what they want in accordance with rules and norms that are established through international law. Um, and then back to your question about uh, what we do together and more activity uh, to present a multinational front uh, recently, I returned from Guam, where we participated alongside Korea and Japan in not a multilateral necessary exercise, but with two different partners in an Operation Christmas Drop. It doesn't have to be hard power. It doesn't have to be, uh, you know, standing up to in, in a military sense. It can also be working together in humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, other multinational engagements that show that we are integrated across all fronts, and, and that in itself provides the deterrence. And so uh, it was an amazing effort uh, in Guam where we both increased our uh, three nations capabilities. We had international observers from multiple other countries there. And so that in itself, while not obviously what the Secretary of Defense was talking about, it is also what the Secretary of Defense was talking about because it shows uh, an agreement between multiple Indo-Pacific nations and that we will be able to work together, uh, not only in hard power, but in soft power. So, anyway, thank you. We, we've all been seeing in the news in the recent days about uh, perhaps an agreement in principle on a declaration of the end of the Korean War between North and South Korea, China, and the U.S. I'm curious to uh, hear what might be the discussion going on on the commands here in Hawaii and whether that protect, pre presents any opportunities or challenges for us in the near future. Please. Why don't we begin, uh, Mr. Worker, here? Okay. Well, it's a little it's a little difficult to discuss something that's that's uh, ongoing, uh, that may be ongoing, and I, I can't really get into sort of the policy formulation process. But I think we're open to looking at what is uh, possible and what would produce results as a as a starting point. However, um, I think it's it's clear that anything anything that we do cannot have an inappropriate impact on our presence on the peninsula. And I think any time we look at the possible end of war declaration or anything of, of that type, we have to make sure that that is not sort of a backdoor to, to undermining our, our presence and alliance. So that, that has to be the starting point for any time we might consider 
uh, such a thing. And so that's, that's the basis that we're going to start from. That said, we'll look at what's, what produces results towards the, the ultimate end of the denuclearization of, of uh, the, the peninsula and, and elimination of the threat posed by, by uh, North Korean weapons of, of mass destruction. Uh, but I, uh, I wouldn't want to uh, sort of get ahead of ourselves. And, and you know, obviously these, these uh, reports are, are widespread and people talk about it in public. But uh, I think it would be a little bit early to, uh, to jump on that, on that bandwagon right now. Thanks. Well, the, you know, the, the yesterday the, the Secretary the Sony Brinken just went down to Jakarta, Indonesia, and this, uh, the speak before the, the college students of the Indonesian National University. The, you know, precisely said that his goal is the, you know, the ultimate goal is the denuclearization of the North Korea. And then he's, you know, emphasizing very calibrated, but, you know, the practical approach. But he didn't, you know, not necessarily means that the, the, you know, the, he will only approach you with a diplomatic solution. So the, he is emphasizing that, you know, the strengthening extended deterrence and also the, the, the ally cooperation. So in that sense, I think, you know, the, from that angle, so the end of Korean War, I think, you know, it didn't really guarantee the, the North Korea's, you know, the, the give up, giving up our, you know, nuclear the option. So there is no hi historical precedent that, you know, the Kim, I mean, Kim Jong-un will give up, you know, the, even though we signed, you know, the beautiful letter, you know, on of the, the, the end of the Korean War statement or all the declaration. So they, I, I think, you know, the, we have to keep in mind that. And then also the, on the other side, you know, I mean, there is always a risk of U.S. ground forces, you know, the, because, you know, the, the, even when we signed any, any agreement, to, you know, with, you know, the, the end of the Korean War statement, the, it will probably cause, you know, the, I mean, some confusion among people. And there are some always people that, the, you know, the, it, it, within the Korea that the, the end of Korean War will bring some peace, right? So the, I think, you know, the, that gives a false promise to the people. So I, I think, you know, this is very, you know, the, I mean, the concerning the, the element. And then also the, that might give, you know, connected to the, the U.S. withdrawal, the issue of U.S. You know, ground forces withdrawal, as well as you know the UNC Lear in you know the, in Japan, right? So I think you know the after signing the document, how we can stand up you know with that kind of the claims and you know the argument when the people bring them together with them, right? So the I think it, all I want to say is that we have to be very careful when he made that kind of decision. So hopefully, as Mr. Lochman said, this is an ongoing issue, so we have to, you know, to, to, I mean, wait until the, the final the decision made by the, the, the Biden administration as well as, you know, South Korean you know, government. Thank you. Thank you. Any other thoughts on end of war? Uh, so just my comments. Um, to be honest, uh, just because we've had such a busy week, it hasn't, we haven't been talking about it as a command, um, but obviously as individuals we do, and so my comments now aren't representing a, in a US in the pack on there, probably just my comments, but for us it's always um, diplomacy first, and um, you're in a much better place to negotiate if it comes from a position of strength, and so this won't you know, change our role um, is in, in, in the alliance in US uh, Indo PACOM's role in supporting the alliance. Um, but, you know, our mantra at Indo PACOM is, is seize the initiative, um, think, act, operate differently, and bold actions are required now to deal with the uh, aggressive adversaries we have. And, you know, things like this, discussions like this are really welcome, but all, obviously all of us are cautious of the second and third order effects that, that might follow such a, 
a pronouncement. Thank you. Thank you, Commodore. Colonel, did you have anything you wanted to add on that? No, I think PACAF will continue uh, with our current uh, pace of operations until told otherwise by Indo-PACOM <laughs> and, our, and our civilian leaders. So I think we'll stay out of this one. <laughs> thank you for that. Uh, let me take one more question from yes. the floor, Dr. Burke. Um, yes, thank you, thank you. Um, my question is specifically for Professor Hong because you, you mentioned the Southern, new Southern policy, right? Um, and we've been talking a lot about on the peninsula, but I'd like to bring in Southeast Asia a little bit. Uh, new Southern policy is primarily focused on economic, social, and cultural. And the big th missing piece is the security, right? And, and especially in Southeast Asia, because Korea doesn't have a history, you know, for, 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 um, uh, for Japan, the World War II, you know, uh, uh, experiences kind of a baggage that they bring to us. So Korea would be the perfect uh, partner, ally, to handle that. But of course, as you said, Korean government has been uh, very hesitant and, uh, uh, what did you say, uh, ambivalent. <laughs> and so can you give me a, a insight into why is that? You know, what are the obstacle barrier that is driving that ambivalent or that, that hesitancy? to get involved in the security arena in, in your southern, new southern policy. Thank you. May I? Please. Well, the, you know, the, th thank you very much for very, you know, the good question. And Madam Bird and Dr. Bird, you know, the, I, I must say that the, I think from the standpoint of Korea, you know, the Korean government, uh, they think that the, you know, the in order to so solve the issue of North Korea, they believe that China's role is very much important. So that's why I think you know, they, they try to invite China's assistance for you know, reaching to Pyongyang. So that's why they, they don't want to antagonize the, the China. So that, that you know, the, but the, you know, the, you know the great zone tactics of China. They, if we didn't answer properly, at the first time, they were, you know, the, recognized it as a fait accompli. So we getting loose lo of, you know, our opportunity to, you know, say later or make ourselves vocal against, you know, their decisions. So it has been four years already. So we've been a lot of, you know, the, some kind of the, the pressures from China, but the, 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 once they, you know, announce their policy as a the go between, you know, the you know the China and the United States, then I think you know the they should be consistent on, on their policy. So, as you just mentioned, we had a lot of you know the the, the the I mean invest in the economic and social and culture, but we are tend not to you know the focus on security issue. That's why Adam Gad is, you know, criticizing us. So the, I think, you know, the somehow, I think we, we have to make it very clear that, you know, the, we are respecting the China's, you know, the role and then China's, you know, the sovereignty, but it doesn't probably, you know, hurt our own national interest, right? So I think we have to make it sure and then try to have a kind of the, the, the capability to, you know, bear the burden of sacrifice or some, you know, the say something against them. So that that kind of the courage we need to take in the future. Is that okay for you? Thank you for that. We will return to questions from the floor and uh, online, uh, time permitting. Uh, but we wanted to take a few minutes and do a bit of a moderated discussion. Uh, with some questions that have been submitted. Uh, first, let me turn uh, to uh, Dan Rockman. And uh, we've noted that uh, Secretary Blinken was in the region. Uh, Commodore brought that up uh, this week. Uh, and if you could talk a bit about the linkage of what we've talked about here today uh, to his messaging uh, in Jakarta about uh, uh, where things are going. And I think uh, Professor Hong's uh, uh, comment just now relative to China actually feeds very nicely into some of what he was explaining. Thank you very much, and it's, it's a good time to discuss that while Secretary Blinken is in the region and, and hopefully uh, will be here in uh, Hawaii 
later this week. And you know, Professor Tong, Hong talked about uh, New Southern policy, and we've just heard more about that, and how it's really in close alignment with, with the United States policy, free and open Indo-Pacific, or by any other name. And that also parallels the policies of our partners, not just Japan, who has its own free and open Indo-Pacific policy, but our partners in Australia, New Zealand, uh, Europe as well. So there is definitely um, a trend where we are all very much in alignment in terms of what we're trying to, to accomplish in the region. So, so now is maybe a good time to take stock of where we're at as, as the United States. And, and Secretary Blinken took advantage of the opportunity of, of his uh, speech, the speech that uh, was discussed by Professor Hong at uh, University of, of Indonesia uh, a couple days ago, where he talked about the region. And he, he talked in a little bit of specifics about uh, where the U.S. government policy is at and, and, and where we're, we're headed, because this, again, does continue to be among the most or most important uh, foreign policy issues that we, that we have right now. And the set of uh, policies that define what we're looking to do in the Indo-Pacific region are really um, extend, the, the, our goals here extend beyond the region are really global goals because all the things that we're trying to achieve here are we're trying to achieve globally, but they're most coming to a head in this AOR, in this region of the world. So Secretary Blinken laid out five, five uh, core elements that he talked about, and just, this is just uh, the day before yesterday in our, in our vision for the region, the U.S. vision for the region, but I think they're all uh, certainly shared by the Republic of Korea and, and by our partners as well. But if I can just go through some of them uh, really quickly. The first is that when we're looking at the region, he reemphasized that we're trying to advance an Indo-Pacific region that's free and open, to repeat those words. But free and open means both for countries and individuals, so that countries can engage in commerce. Countries uh, have the benefits of, of, uh, of free maritime waterways but that individuals as well, in terms of their expression, in terms of their ability to travel, in terms of them to pursue their, their, their businesses, have a region in which problems are dealt with openly, rules are reached transparently and applied fairly, and that people, ideas, goods can all flow freely across borders. Uh, and, and across borders includes in, in the global commons, not only maritime global commons, but also uh, cyberspace as well. And governments need to be transparent and responsive to the people. So that's the first core, core area, but it's also, I think, the, the, the principle that everything else is, is built on. So the second, the second core element he talked about was uh, forging stronger connections within and beyond the region. That's what we've been talking about a lot, whether it's our deep and treaty alliance with uh, the Republic of Korea and our other four treaty allies in the region, Australia, Japan, the Philippines, and, and Thailand, or with treaty allies outside the region, like, like the UK, like France, and also with other just friends and partners in the region. And that's sort of what I was talking about in response to, to an earlier question. The third of these core elements is promoting broad-based prosperity through trade, investment, and, and our policy to ensure the free flow of goods, uh, investment, and ideas. So right now, the U.S. government is working on an Indo-Pacific economic framework that's going to help define how we pursue those shared objectives. But in particular, it's, it's the forward-looking objectives like the digital economy, technology, resilient supply chains, which are really highlighted over the past two years because of, because of COVID and because of the concentration of uh, semiconductor um, production. And if you, if, you, if you bought a car like somebody like me who just moved to the island a few months ago, you know that the price of cars or the supply of cars is very restricted because of the semiconductor issue. And that uh, is across the economy, just one example. But we want to make sure we have resilient supply chains, and at the same time that we're working on decarbonization and clean energy to deal with climate and, uh, and building better infrastructure. The fourth of the core elements 
is having a more uh, resilient region. And the two areas that are really highlighted under resiliency are uh, pandemic response and climate. So, you know, uh, along with our, our partners in the Quad and with the ROK and others, we're trying to help respond to the current pandemic. And the United States has distributed over 100 million vaccine doses in the region. But beyond that, we want to build, or we're working to build, the health systems for the future that will be able to detect and respond to future pandemics. Because we know this is not going to be the last time that we face a challenge like this. So we need to be prepared for the future. And the other, the other similar challenge that we face that affects us all, that's outside borders, is climate. And that is another uh, key element of, of resiliency in the region, and particularly as we deal with partners among the Pacific Island countries and others in this region who will be most affected by climate change. And then finally, to bring what brings it back to the, to the discussion today is uh, bolstering Indo-Pacific security in the face of evolving threats. That's the fifth core element that Secretary Blinken talked about. And again, we just talked about integrated deterrence, but that will continue to be a core element of U.S. security policy going forward as we look to weave together all of our instruments of national power, whether it be uh, diplomacy, people-to-people -people connections, or the instruments of security and, and military power, uh, and we work together with our allies and partners in the region to uh, put us in better condition to deal with the evolving threats that we, that we see right now and that are apparent uh, as, as we go forward. So, thank, you. thank you for that. And, and you know, the, in, in some ways, the Secretary's uh, comments this week were, were also uh, an interesting build out of where the joint communique was uh, seven months ago that uh, the U.S. and uh, ROK presidents uh, committed to a, a rather beefy uh, communique, and so uh, a lot of those points are, are not only consistent, but, but really show a maturation uh, in our relationship and in our common commitment on these fronts. And, and, and one thing I want to stress is that you can see this across our relationships and when we're dealing with other partners and allies, you see similar threads. But to me, what's more important is that in similar communiques between partners that don't involve the United States, you see the same the same elements being repeated. So it's really indicative of a shared set of objectives, a shared vision, and a shared understanding of the things that we need to do to get to that vision of what the region should look like. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Hong, did you have a comment on what yeah. Mr. Reference left us? Two points. You know, the, I think, you know, as you just mentioned, the strategic communication is very much important. And then the, I think you know, the South Korea is, is always interesting and, you know, TSIB, so it, uh, technological security and industrial basis. So the, we are very much interested in extending our relationship with Australia and in Great Britain, United States, and Canada, and others, you know, for, for protecting our, you know, new technologies. Because the, this year alone, you know, the, the U.S., I mean, the, the White House has invited, you know, three, three times of, you know, the CEOs of, you know, the, the, our the top industry, SK, you know, including Samsung and LG. So the, we realized that you know the, uh, I mean the the technology is part of national security. So I think you know, but you know, in order to protect the our own security, or or you know the the, the new, new skills and new technologies, I think we, we can do this alone. So we need you know kind of protection, and we need to find the ways and means to discuss with others, right? So that's why I think we have to broaden our perspectives and then also we need to deal with you know, others for dealing with this. So that, that's why we need to increase our strategic communication with the other, you know, the advanced countries. So that's one point. And then also the, as you know, so the, Mr. Rochman mentioned that the, you know, the, the we, you know, the, the Secretary Blinken has I mean, mentioned about the hope and future tied with the, the large numbers of people living in this region. I think that is very good message for you know, the, South, the East Asian, you know, the people living in that area. This is more than 10 countries. I think you know, the Ralph Kosa knows much better than myself. And then the, the people from ASEAN, 
the feels very much you know, uncomfortable and then the still needs more commitment from the United States Biden administration so after passing you know, the, the, the Trump administration. So they, they expect a lot. But the, they already, the, the friends of um, ASEAN told me that the, the United States is still far away. And then the China threat is too close. So that, that's a kind of the dilemma they are facing. So I think you know, the, the, the Tony Blinken's you know, the, the visit to Jakarta is very much you know, in time and then precise and then very good sign. But the, I think it, they'll probably expect further for the United States to you know, kind of the, the have some, show some more readership. Well, that, that's a, my. Yeah, thank you. Oh, please, Mr. Rock. Sorry if I can respond to your response. Um, I think you raised a point that's really critical on uh, intellectual property and protection of that. And so this continues to be a really top priority for, for the State Department and the U.S. government as a whole is information security. And traditionally, when we think of information security, we think about uh, either military or, or intelligence information that governments want to make sure doesn't fall into the wrong hands. But also, very, very explicitly, we're concerned with uh, industrial information security, too. Not only so that the product of people's hard work and their companies doesn't get stolen from them, but also as a key element of, of national uh, security as well. So uh, it's really over the past, I don't know, decade or past few years, it's, it's risen to the top rank of our, of our uh, efforts, uh, information security, but particularly uh, increasingly focused on uh, industrial information security as well. So I, I just wanted to say that's a really important point. Uh, yes. Yeah. And then we'll move on. yeah the, on the NTIB, you know, the everybody understand that we got a lot of hackings from the DPRK, North Korea, right? But uh, since last uh, June, the the hacking numbers are, you know, the, the, the from China is much already surpassed the DPRK. So that means, you know, the, our, the, I mean, the new technology, the industrial basis, the, they, they are very much con concerned about, you know, the protecting ourselves. So as repeatedly, you know, mentioned again, but again, but the, this can be done the, by Korean alone. So that's why the, we need the cooperation among the, you know, the, some, the allies and you know, protection and then we need to find some new mechanism to deal with it. Sure. I, th I think broadly, too, worth noting that, that both of your comments on uh, technology and diversification of, of supply chain come at an important time just a few weeks after Samsung has announced a $17 billion investment uh, outside of Austin, Texas, and semiconductors, and, and you know, just one of many examples of the benefits we're seeing of uh, the Corus FTA and enhanced Korean investment in, in the U.S., but certainly diversifying those supply chains away. Uh, let me turn to Commodore uh, Luke Charles Jones and for a build out on this issue of uh, sort of changing uh, regional dynamic. We've just mentioned the Secretary's uh, of State's uh, trip to the region, uh, but you've rightly noted too that uh, President uh, Moon was with uh, Prime Minister uh, Morrison this last week. Uh, some interesting developments. Of course, we have the broader overlay, overlay of uh, uh, the new AUKUS arrangement, Australia-UK-US arrangement, um, uh, which will, will be interesting not only in the trilateral element, but, but really, you know, for our sake here today, you know, how it relates to, to use, uh, complementary developments relative to uh, changing roles. And uh, I wondered if you had some thoughts on, on building that out a bit. Uh, thank you. I've, I've spoken to some of these um, points. All, in fact, all of us really have, have been talking to this. Um, and it, it is in response to what we've seen uh, um, malign or increasingly aggressive malign uh, activities, particularly the PRC, that we've seen right across the Indo-Pacific theatre. And, and to date, if the way we approach this is through the US PRC approach, it's allowed this suggestion that to other nations in the theatre that you know you can go with the US for security or you can go with the PRC for prosperity, and it, you get this sort of binary answer, which is which is you know makes no sense and is is not uh, the case at all. And so through diversifying our approach from bilateral to minilateral or multilateral, it 
defies that sort of commentary that this is a binary approach. Um, and so, you know, to seek the end state of a free and open Indo-Pacific, to watch these increasingly aggressive line actions that we've spoken about um, quite a bit this afternoon, we need to do something differently. And these announcements and these activities you see through the Indian Quad, through AUKUS, um, through Secretary Blinken's um, Indo-Pacific strategy uh, announced in, um, in, in Indonesia, even through the most recent... Um, and I, I've only seen um, the communique, so I, I don't know anything beyond that, which, which is open to the public on the, um, the Comprehensive Strategic uh, Partnership. But I did notice that that Comprehensive Strategic Partnership between Australia and um, the Republic of Korea has three pillars. And so while we understand that the um, New South policy doesn't have a security element, it's interesting to note that one of the, the pillars is strategic and security uh, under that uh, comprehensive strategic partnership. So, um, so there might be a security element to it. Um, but it, it, again, it comes back to me for a realisation within Indo-PACOM that to um, address this, these malign um, actions and malign objectives and make sure we retain a free Indo Pacific and make sure we maintain the rules based um, international order. Uh, we've got to do this together, and the more the merrier. Um, and so, at the, uh, the recent Halifax uh, activity or that um, Admiral Aquilino attended. He spoke specifically to some of the actions that, that we do together that gets after this concept of integrated deterrence, um, which we see is so vital to be able to uh, deter um, our adversaries. And those are um, some of the examples, and I'll read, read from his speech, actually, uh, where he talked about seven nations, including Canada, the Netherlands, the UK, Japan, New Zealand, Australia and the United States, with more than 15,000 sailors and marines, conducting exercises with four Kara strike group in October in the, in the Philippine Sea. So not, not, um, not nations that typically work together, particularly in this region. And so that, that's one example. Um, the US and Canadian navies conducting a combined Taiwan state transit, or the French-led La Perouse exercise with naval assets from Australia, France, India, Japan, and the United States. And as we know, the French are a big um, participant in this region uh, in theatre, often sending their, their carrier uh, and their um, landing craft units through this region. Um, the deployment, the recent deployment of the German frigate, uh, the Bay M, to the region and her participation um, in the United Nations Security Council uh, resolutions off the Korean Peninsula. So, you know, if you were to say something like this uh, five years ago, um, you, you know, it just wasn't happening. And so uh, the growth of the Quad, um, I would say if we talked about uh, the Quad five years ago, again, from an Australian perspective, we were hoping to recommence military activities under that Quad. It didn't start as a military partnership. It's, it's, it is an economic partnership. It is a different relationship. But there are security elements to it that all of us can benefit from. Um, and so... From an Indo-PACOM perspective, we want to start thinking, acting and operate differently to do things that make a difference in deterring our, our um, adversaries from their malign objectives. What we've been doing to date, or in the past, hasn't changed their approach to those objectives and we need to change that uh, to maintain a free and Indo-Pacific. Thank you. Thank you, Commodore. And Colonel Marshall, you may have some thoughts in that direction, uh, and I specifically uh, posed a question for you about the uh, overlay and, and uh, complementary support of PACAF relative to the relationship uh, with USFK uh, and how things transpire relative to the relationship on the peninsula and the relationship here in Hawaii. Excellent. Yeah. On the peninsula, uh, we have our standard set of exercises that we do on our regular sets of engagement. Again, the relationship is very solid. What we're seeing outside of the peninsula and not just from Korea, we're seeing, we don't have the issue of, of 
a lack of willingness to participate in exercises or engagements across the region. Um, everyone wants to do multilateral. Um, what we have problems doing is prioritizing and making each of those effective. And so in things like Red Flag Alaska, our largest uh, Indo-Pacific air exercise, or uh, Operation Christmas Shop, for example, or Cope North, these are exercises that everyone wants to participate in. And not only our US-led exercise, I should say, Pitch Black in Australia is growing into a major multilateral exercise that involves um, Korea, potentially, and Southeastern uh, Asian nations. So you brought up the maybe the lack of security pillar, but it's, it's manifesting itself throughout our multilateral exercises across the region. And so I think that enabling those types of engagements, uh, both in the lead role and just as a participant from a US perspective, uh, is important to us. And in a lot of cases, I'll point out that we, we don't always want to be the lead. We want to play as a, just a participant, for example, in Pitch Black or other smaller engagements. And in a lot of cases, that's in all the participants' best interest, where the United States is not the, the face of these exercises. Uh, we, we often would love to just be participants and, and allow our allies and partners to work together with us to learn from them uh, as equals. So. That's how, we, that's how we look at things across the region right now. Thank you, Colonel Marshall. Uh, and we're spot on time. We have uh, time for a question or two, uh, either from the floor or remotely, please. <coughs> Professor Cho. Uh, yes, my question is uh, specifically for uh, Colonel, um, Colonel Marshall. Um, so in July 2019, so Russia and China, they did uh, their air, pot air patrol in, on the Sea of Japan or East, uh, East Sea, uh, and they flew over to Tok, uh, Tokto Takeshima, and the, which prompted South Korean Air Force's response, and then South Korean aircraft shot, uh, shot against the Russian uh, military aircraft. It was the warning shot, but the first time that South Korean Air Force ever shot, fired the uh, live bullet uh, in the area. And then Japanese government criticized South Korean government to conduct military uh, operation in the air that Japan claims its own and then South Korea uh, following that reiterate that the air is above the territory that belongs to South Korea. So if it was Russia and China's intention to really reveal Recording in progress. the divergence between Japan and uh, South Korea, they were very successful. And my follow-up question is that, so related to that, uh, it would have been beautiful if Japanese and South Korean Air Force, they uh, respond together against Russia and Ch Chinese air, uh, joint air patrol, but it was not the case. So was there any reflection about that incident or more broadly, can you comment on the status or potential for the Japanese and uh, South Korean Air Force operational uh, cooperation? Thank you. Thanks for the question. Uh, First of all, I was not in PACAF at that time, so I was not, I am not aware of the details of that. So luckily, uh, maybe that's good for me, that I can't necessarily comment on the, the details of that incident. Uh, I do know that two things. One, um, this goes back to our international norms, right? There are pr processes and procedures for these things that are established at an international level. And I know the United States supports those processes and procedures, right? We are party to many of those uh, international agreements and we agree to facilitate those solutions to happen at that level, not necessarily dictated unilaterally uh, between uh, individual countries, right? There are, there are those norms. So I think I can speak on solid ground when I say that that is the route that the United States would take in that incident. Um, as far as facilitating cooperation between uh, Japan and Korea, I think the gentleman down there kind of nailed it that we would like to like the Japanese and Koreans to, to work their problems out more than we would like them to work them out, right? And so whenever there is an issue between two of our allies and partners, the United States can facilitate, but we, we would not, from a PACAF perspective, uh, want to get into the middle of that. Um, and now moving on to the next level of air domain awareness and intercepts and unsafe actions uh, in the international commons. One of our lines of effort is to increase coordination in the region between all of our allies and partners to establish truth about what is happening uh, 
in the international airspace or sovereign airspace of certain nations. And so information sharing uh, as soon as possible. I know I've heard Admiral Aquilino say he would love to see everyone see the same thing at the same time. And, and I know that that is our goal too. Uh, and we are working on that type of activity at this time. We, the technology and the agreements aren't there yet, but it is one of our lines of effort and one of General Wilsbach's lines of effort is to increase uh, air domain awareness sharing across the region and incidents like that could possibly, again, not familiar with that particular incident, but could be mitigated and the reactions could be mitigated if everyone saw the same thing at the same time and could agree on what happened. So from a PACAP perspective. Thank you. Any final questions? Okay, so if not, um, Thank you, for the Commodore, if you don't mind. So um, looking at Indo-PACOM's uh, priorities, uh, could you comment on how they relate to the Korean Peninsula? So I just missed the very last part of what you said, how they relate to the Korean Peninsula, right. did you say? Right. Indo-PACOM's uh, priorities and how they relate to the uh, Korean Peninsula. So you could just talk about that a little bit. Yeah, so um, that, that discussion I had about the broader challenges uh, across the whole theatre, none of that at all diminishes... Um, our requirements and responsibilities that we have to the uh, US-Korean alliance and our objectives on the Korean Peninsula. And so I've, I went through them um, earlier and so I'll just reiterate, um, you know, our role and what we pursue while we're there. But it's that uh, the US Indo-PACOM supports the Combined Forces Command through the unit US uh, Forces Korea, providing force, forces should hostilities resume. Um, we advocate for multinational support for the Republic of Korea um, through the United Nations Command and its relationships across the region. We facilitate the trilateral cooperation between the US, Japan and the Republic of Korea to prepare and respond to DPRK actions. We advance the multilateral uh, cooperation throughout the region um, to advance our common security interests. So that, that objective uh, very clearly re relates to the broader of how we we work together through the alliance across those broader responsibilities. And finally, we enable diplomacy by leveraging the military instrument of national power to create room and space um, for those diplomatic efforts from a position of strength. So whilst we're focused on some of these new multilateral arrangements, whilst we're focused on all these minor, malign objectives we're seeing in the South China Sea, um, the attacks on Australia uh, through cyber and the trade attacks, um, we're seeing through, you know, Second Thomas Shoal, um, the economic debt traps that people are falling into, our concerns about Oceania and PRC basing. None of that diminishes the absolute um, priority that we place on security on the peninsula. Thank you. Thank you. Well, wonderful. Barring any further questions, then let, let us draw to a close before we transition to the, the closing part of our ceremony here today. Uh, and thank uh, Daniel Walkman, uh, Hong Kyu Dok, uh, Luke Charles Jones, and Steve Marshall for their kind observations. Uh, thank you all for your questions uh, and uh, for the rich discussion today. Uh, and again, to uh, General Books, uh, General Chung, and uh, to Steve Lee and the entire team. Uh, it's been a pleasure for all of us uh, on a very rich afternoon's discussion indeed. Thank you and uh, happy holiday to everyone. Okay, so uh, we're at the uh, closing and as we say, uh, as the panel leaves the stage, we'll do some uh, final uh, uh, comments. Okay, so um, ladies and gentlemen, we just had some really great discussions and it's been a uh, very uh, insightful and relevant discussions. Um, this is how we uh, actually hoped and designed uh, the conference. Um, we're, not, we're not done yet. We're not done yet, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so uh, we'll have time to do more of the socialization right after this uh, during the uh, beer and wine hour.
So please stick around. We're going to be, as soon as we do the closing, acknowledge some thank yous and closing remarks. We'll do the uh, Pauhana right, at, uh, right afterwards. So again, uh, so ladies and gentlemen, just, just a couple more minutes, please. Okay, so thank you very much. So we welcome uh, General Jung, sir, for your uh, closing remarks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Pre President Lee gun -Soo just requested me to make this simple. Yes, we have a very good discussion today. In uh, session one, uh, I believe the DPAA and Korean Macri had a, a great cooperation so far, and uh, uh, I believe, but we still have some room to improve better cooperation between two, two great organizations. In session two, it was a good opportunity to understand the uh, role of Indo-PACOM more deeply. Uh, the, I believe the mo most discussion was made in kind of a strategic level, but uh, however, uh, I believe uh, in operational level, we need to uh, yeah, improve the deterrence uh, capability uh, of the, uh, on North Korean uh, nuclear capability. I heard when I visited uh, in the PACOM this morning, uh, the, uh, they are going to have a chief of defense meeting uh, next uh, month among uh, U.S. and uh, Japan and Korea, hosted by indo uh, I hope it should be the uh, good momentum to increase the trilateral uh, cooperation among those uh, three countries. And uh, finally, I hope that this event uh, can uh, the, uh, contribute to uh, strengthen the alliance between Korea and United States. Uh, I would like to express the uh, appreciation to all the moderators and panelists who made a very good presentation. Uh, please join me to give them a big applause. And my second appreciation goes to uh, the uh, audiences, uh, both here and both in Zoom. Uh, thank you for the, uh, the, your attention. Finally, I would like to uh, praise the good work by the staff members of both CUSAP and KDVA. Uh, they made a uh, yeah, great, great work. Please join me once again. A big applause to them. Thank you very much. All right. So let me just add a couple more thank yous to that. I uh, really appreciate the uh, great staff here at the Marriott. Uh, thank you for uh, bending over backwards to uh, prepare and support us. Uh, I also want to recognize some volunteers, KDVA volunteers here in Hawaii. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Retired Rich Lenz again, the uh, president of the uh, new uh, KDVA chapter here in Hawaii. KDVA, we're opening up uh, chapters uh, all over the United States and we're thankful that uh, people like Rich have volunteered to take leadership and continue the uh, great work that was started here this week, so thanks Rich. Um, Beth Ann Connor and her son Bryson Connor, they were the ones that, that greeted you at the registration table. 
they are longtime friends of ours from Korea. They served, her husband um, retired as a colonel. They love Korea so much that even after they left Korea and came to Hawaii, paradise, they vacation in Korea. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, we also want to thank uh, U.S. Air Force uh, Major Chaeun Kim. He is a KDVA research associate. Okay. So this guy is on active duty. So he's a great example of someone who still looks to make contributions uh, beyond what he does for his day job. So in his spare time, he helps us out, researches articles. He made a lot of the aviation thing connect with Zoom, two different languages, three, five different time zones. So thank you very much for doing that, uh, Chaelin, really appreciate it. And then I'd like to uh, thank uh, Kristen Lentz, she is uh, Rich's boss, and her Aroma K company for making the wonderful centerpieces. So we're gonna spend just a couple minutes doing this. This is part of the centerpieces, right? Okay, and then the smaller ones are here. So we're gonna ask that you go ahead and play Kai Bai Bo for the centerpiece to see who wants to, I know everyone's been eyeing the centerpieces and want to take it home. So right now, just spend about 30 seconds. Let's do Kai Bai Bo. And if you don't have the centerpieces on your table, go to some place and let's knock out Kai Bai Bo to see who's going to take the centerpieces. Okay, Kai Bai, oh, I'm sorry. Kai Bai Bo means rock, paper, scissors. Okay, rock, paper, scissors. All right, so here we go. Ready, everybody at the tables. Just go ahead and do uh, rock, paper, scissors to see who takes stuff. Oh, I want to do it on my thing. So we really appreciate that, and we always want to support spouses of veterans. Okay, so finally, I want to thank... Um, Ms. Erlene Hollerith, she is General Brooks's executive assistant. She is the one that really put everything together. Unbelievable hard work. Uh, this conference, I'm just going to be very honest, it had several obstacles uh, and challenges due to the pandemic and coordination across long distances and several time zones. And then on top of that, we had the challenge of Indo-PACOM having an avalanche of senior visitors uh, visiting them this week. And that includes the Secretary of State, the Deputy Secretary of Defense. So even as busy as they were, we really appreciate how Indo-PACOM hosted our visit to their headquarters this morning. And they sent their uh, best folks here uh, for this pay. So really like to give a round of applause to Indo-PACOM. Thank you. All right, so we close our third and final uh, Alliance Peace Conference for 2021. Uh, we look forward to a great uh, things to come in Hawaii, uh, South Korea, and the rest of the United States. So please have a great holiday, Malikimikimaka, and Happy New Year, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.